Hello everybody, happy 4th of July. Once again, we're going to hit you up with another presidential election. This one, the election of 1952. Two new candidates going at it to determine who will succeed Harry S. Truman as President of the United States. Who's going to get it done? Let's find that out right now. Now we're going to start off with the incumbent party as always, and that'll be the Democrats. The incumbent president, Harry S. Truman from Missouri, ascended to the presidency in 1945, following the death of FDR, elected to a full term in 1948. But by the time 1952 rolls around, um, there was no doubt that Truman would be the Democratic candidate for president. But given his low popularity and the stalemated Korean War, he decides not to run for a second full term as president. Now, the recently passed 22nd Amendment um, did not apply to Truman since he was the sitting president when that amendment was passed. The amendment says that no president can serve more than two terms. So Truman was eligible to run for as many terms as he would like. But he decides not to run for a second full term in 1952. So this leaves the Democratic nomination wide open. So the candidates putting themselves up for the nomination were the sitting vice president, Alvin W. Barkley of Kentucky, Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, Senator Estes Favre of Tennessee, Senator Robert S. Kerr of Oklahoma, Senator Richard Russell Jr. of Georgia, and the governor of Illinois, Adlai Stevenson the second, who was the grand, who is the grandson of Adlai Stevenson the first, Grover Cleveland's second vice president. At the end of the day, it is going to be Stevenson who receives the Democratic nomination for president. And he is going to bring along for the ride Alabama Senator John Sparkman as his running mate. Now that we have our Democratic ticket of Stevenson and Sparkman, let's go to the Republicans. Now the Republicans are looking to win their first presidential election since 1928, and the candidates putting themselves up for nomination were Dwight D. Eisenhower of New York, the Supreme Allied Commander from World War II, um, Ohio Senator Robert A. Taft, Harold Stassen of Minnesota, the Governor of California, Earl Warren, the Vice Presidential nominee from 1948, and General Douglas MacArthur of New York. At the end of the day, it is going to be General Eisenhower who receives the Republican nomination. After rejecting both the Democratic and Republican nominations in 1948, he's going to bring along for the ride a young senator named Richard Nixon from California as his running mate, Nixon known for his anti-communist crusades. Now that we have our Democratic ticket of Stevenson and Sparkman, and our Republican ticket of Eisenhower and Nixon, let's put these guys into the ring, Governor versus General, and let's see who wins this thing. Now, the Eisenhower campaign was one of the first presidential campaigns to make a major concerted effort to win the female vote. Many of his radio and television commercials discussed topics such as education, inflation, ending the war in Korea, and other issues that were thought to appeal to women. The Korean War had began in 1950 between North Korea and South Korea, United States, and UN forces. Um, this war was stalemated by the time 1952 rolled around, and eventually in July of 1953, so after Truman had already left office, um, an armistice was signed between the two warring parties. Now, I want to emphasize that technically, North and South Korea, as of 2016, is still in a state of war because a peace treaty is never signed. Has never been signed between the two sides. Anyway, the Eisenhower campaign made extensive use of female campaign workers. These workers made phone calls to likely Eisenhower voters, 
distributed act buttons and leaflets and through parties to build support for the GOP ticket in their neighborhoods. And on election day, Eisenhower would win a solid majority of the female votes. Now, Eisenhower campaigned by attacking Korea, communism, and corruption. That is, what the Republicans regarded as the failures of the outgoing Truman administration, remember Truman's not running, <clears throat> to deal with these issues. The Eisenhower campaign accused the administration of neglecting Latin America and thus leading them into the arms of wily communist agents waiting to exploit local misery and capitalize on any opening to communize the Americas. Charges that Soviet spies had infiltrated the government plagued the Truman administration and also became a major campaign issue for Eisenhower. The Republicans blamed the Democrats for the military's failure to be fully prepared to fight in Korea. They accused the Democrats of harboring communist spies within the federal government. And they blasted the Truman administration for the numbers of officials who had been accused of various crimes. Now, in return, the Democrats criticized Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin and other Republican conservatives as fear mongers who were recklessly trampling on the civil liberties of government employees. Now, many Democrats were particularly upset when Eisenhower, on a scheduled campaign swing through Wisconsin, decided not to give a speech he had written criticizing McCarthy's methods and then allowed himself to be photographed shaking hands with McCarthy as if he supported him. Now, McCarthy had been a big-time communist crusader and he was the person that thought communists had infiltrated the State Department, had infiltrated the Army, and turned out that all of his accusations were hogwash and he was condemned <clears throat> for his actions. Now, Truman, formerly friends with Eisenhower, never forgot what he saw as a betrayal. He had previously thought Eisenhower would make a good president, but said he has betrayed almost everything I thought he stood for. Now, despite these mishaps, Eisenhower retained his enormous personal popularity from his leading role in World War II, because obviously war hero, woohoo, war hero popular, and huge crowds turned out to see him around the nation. His campaign slogan, I Like Ike, was one of the most popular in American history. Now, Stevenson concentrated on giving a series of thoughtful speeches around the nation. He, too, drew large crowds. Although his style thrilled intellectuals and academics, some political experts wondered if he were speaking over the heads of most of his listeners, and they dubbed him an egghead based on his baldness and intellectual demeanor. Eisenhower maintained a comfortable lead in the polls throughout most of the campaign. Now, a notable event of the campaign concerned a scandal that emerged when Richard Nixon, remember Eisenhower's running mate, was accused by several newspapers of receiving $18,000 in undeclared gifts from wealthy donors. In reality, contributions were by design only from early supporters and limited to $1,000 with full accountability. Nixon, who had been accusing the Democrats of hiding crooks, suddenly found himself on the defensive. Eisenhower and his aides considered dropping Nixon from the ticket and picking another running mate. But Nixon stayed his hide with a dramatic half-hour speech called the Checker Speech on live television. In this speech, Nixon denied the charges against him, gave a detailed account of his modest financial assets, and offered a glowing assessment of Eisenhower's candidacy. The highlight of the speech came when Nixon stated that a supporter had given his daughters a gift, a dog named Checkers and that he would not return it because his daughters loved it. The checker speech led hundreds of thousands of citizens nationwide to rire the Republican National Committee, urging the Republican Party to keep Nixon on the ticket, and at the end of the day, General Eisenhower ends up keeping him on the ticket. Now, both campaigns made use of television ads. A notable ad for Eisenhower was an issue-free, feel-good animated cartoon with a soundtrack song by Irving Berlin, who's a famous composer, called I Like Ike. For the first time, a presidential candidate's personal medical history was released publicly as were partial versions of his financial histories because of the issues raised in Nixon's speech. Near the end of the campaign, Eisenhower, in a major speech, speech announced that if he won the election, he would go to Korea to see if he could end the war. His great prestige, combined with the public's wariness with the conflict, gave Eisenhower the final boost he needed to win. And throughout the entire campaign, um, Eisenhower led in all opinion polls and by wide margins in most of them. 
And with that, let's get to the results right now. The Republicans are going to win their first presidential election since 1928, and they also win narrow control of the House and Senate. Dwight Eisenhower and the Republicans are going to receive 442 electoral votes, while Stevenson and the Democrats receive 89 electoral votes. 39 states, including four southern states, vote for Dwight Eisenhower and the Republicans, while nine states, including seven from the South, vote for Adlai Stevenson and the Democrats. Um, Eisenhower and the Republicans are going to win 55.2% of the popular vote, while 44.3% of that goes to Stevenson and the Democrats. So the Republicans back in the White House. And now can the Republicans get the stigma of being associated with the Great Depression off of their shoulders? And will Eisenhower run for a second term? We'll talk about that next time in the election of 1956. And with that, I want to thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got a lot out of it. Once again, happy 4th of July. And if you haven't seen any of my previous videos, go ahead and watch those if you want. And with that, we will see you next time with the election of 1956.